to be praised. We lift our voice. Amen. Aren't you grateful he hears us? Hi, Addie. On our best days and our worst days, our Savior hears us. And we can lift high the name of Jesus. As the book of Acts says, there is no other name under heaven by which man must be saved. And that is through the name of Jesus. Um, if you don't know me, I'm Pastor Dennis. I'm Kimberly. I head up the kids' ministry here at Lakes. And we're going to bring a few announcements. I'm going to bring one, men's retreat. I'm super stoked, super excited. Yeah, whoop. Uh, there's a flyer back here. Could the men in the, that are part of the men's ministry team stand up while I'm giving the announcement? It is the last um, weekend of April, April 26th and 27th. We're going to do just one night this year. We're going to go up Friday night 
Come back Saturday night. We got two guest speakers. Super excited. Uh, the theme is advance and advancing towards the Lord. And we want to do it together in unity. So I really want to encourage you, men, grab one of these men that are standing and hit them up. They'll get you signed up. I would love for it to be packed out for not a man in here to miss this retreat. Kimberly, take her away. There's another retreat happening in April, and that is the Youth Spring Retreat. That is April 19th through 21st at Schweitzer, and it is an awesome time. Kids come back with hearts and lives changed. So if you have a youth student and you want to know more, talk to Pastor Chase. He can give you all the details. He's in the back right there. Wave for the people, Chase. And on the subject of youth group, you may not know this, but every Wednesday when the youth group meets, there is a meal provided for them. It is such a blessing to them. They feed all the kids and volunteers. And the way they do that is through our contributions. They invite people to sign up and bring a meal. So I wanted to tell you something that our life group has been doing. We have, as a life group, been banding together to provide a meal. It can be a little bit tough to feed 50 people as just one family, but when several families come together to do that, it's a lot easier. So some folks just pitch in money to help offset the cost. Some people will provide cookies or rolls or whatever. We just kind of work together to put that meal together. And so I wanted to encourage you, if you're part of a life group, that could be a great way for you to serve together and serve the youth by providing that meal. I also wanted to let you know our plans for Easter this year. I'm so excited for what we have planned. Um, every year we do a Good Friday service, so that'll be Friday, March 29th at 6.30 p.m. We do have kids programming at the same time. We'll have a preschool and an elementary lesson during that time. So it's for ages 3 through 5th grade. We won't have the nursery staffed, but we will have the nursery open. So if you have a toddler that you bring and they get a little antsy, you're welcome to take them in there. But I do encourage you to bring your kids because we have a, a wonderful lesson for them as well. And then Sunday morning, uh, Easter Sunday, March 31st, normally that would be a family Sunday for us because it falls on a fifth Sunday. And we, we prayed and thought about that a lot. And we decided not to do a family Sunday this year, partly because we usually have a lot of visitors for Easter. And we wanted our visitors to come and experience a, a typical Sunday here at Lakes. And so we decided we are going to have Sunday school classes on Easter Sunday. It will be special. We will be doing some fun things to celebrate Easter, but it will be a typical Sunday in that regard. And lastly, I just wanted to share with you all that we are in need of volunteers in the kids' ministry in almost every classroom. We've been so blessed at this church that we have so many faithful servants in that area, but we've had a few people who have had to step down for health reasons. And so we do have openings in the nursery, the toddler classroom, and the third through fifth grade classroom. So I really do believe that the Lord is, raises up people to serve in those areas. And so if you've been feeling a tug in your heart, maybe that's the Lord urging you to join into a new ministry that you haven't done before. So we do ask that people attend here for six months before they start serving in kids' ministry. You do have to have a background check, uh, but if you have any questions, you'd like to know more about serving in kids' ministry, please talk to me. I'd love to tell you more about it. Awesome. That's it. Thank you, Kimberly. So at this time, we're going to ask real quick for the Mexico missions team, those who are going on the trip this week. Uh, I have the privilege to go. I'm super excited. Pastor Scott is going to share, or pray, I should say, uh, over us, but real quick, um, Em, you coming up? Mexico missions team, who's here that's going? Anybody else? Yeah, come on up. Yeah. Robin and Casey are fearless leaders. Yes. Um, and Josh, real quick, uh, he wants to share something on his heart uh, regarding this, so we're pretty excited. All right. Uh, super cool story. Uh, God is always moving, even when we can't see it. But sometimes we're privileged to be able to watch his hand move, open doors, and do miracles. Yeah. Right? So. I know you want to share. <laughs> You're dying to share. Something. What? I don't like talking on the microphone. Okay. Um, so Tuesday at staff meeting, Pastor Dennis mentioned, he was like, oh, hey, we had a spot open up on the team with the team that's going down. And Josh hadn't planned on going on the spring trip because Lincoln and I are going, and that's a lot to hit our finances. And so I called Josh just on a whim, hoping that he could go. 
And he was like, you know what, let's just do it. We'll just trust God that the finances. No, I, we were going to walk through the open doors. We are going to walk through the open door first, yes. That's what we do. Yeah, and so I had to take off my shoes. So I count on my toes. And I'm like, man, because we still, we covered 300 of his trip. And so it was a little over. Robin was like, just cover the plane ticket at this point. Um, we can worry about the rest later. And so that was going to be like 900 and some dollars to come up with like that. So, but we were like, let's do it. We'll just walk through that open door. And then lo and behold. So we had talked about this Tuesday. The staff meeting is when it came up. We went through the open doors, talked to my boss. She said, take it off. No big deal. She talked to Robin. We were, so we came together Wednesday, got home. Uh, we were just talking together. I had grabbed some mail that was on a counter and just going through some stuff. I opened one of our letters, <coughs> and it was from the Washington State Department of Revenue. And I said, oh, that's interesting. Weird. So I'm like, what's in here? Uh, so I open it up, and there's a little letter in there that's kind of explaining, and supposedly Washington State passed a law, and they can send you money if a past employer or somebody left money for you, and they send it right off. They don't have to uh, have you sign or His get past approved. employer didn't have to hunt him I down. Right. Washington did that for him. Long her. story short, I open up this letter and it's got a check in there for 930 some odd dollars so which was like okay there's, there's one more little have part no clue where it came from probably yeah. don't even need to know obviously the lord opened up a door he took a step of faith yeah so the other funny part though is i'm doing the math and i'm like that puts us within like 50 dollars. i'm like that's awesome we can come up with 50 dollars. i'll go sell a couple gnomes so then josh gets this look on his face and I was like, what? He goes, well, funny story. I was sharing with a coworker about the opportunity to go to this orphanage. And earlier that day, his coworker opened up his wallet and handed Josh a $50 bill and said, I would like to contribute to your trip. So. So he's a show off. So God is always moving. We know that. We have to believe that. We know he is. Uh, but when he does that, it's just a super... I don't know. He's just saying, I love you. Yeah. Just, I want you to know that I'm, I'm working on your behalf. And when you're walking in the way that you are supposed to walk, I'll provide for you. And I mean, he's got more money than we could even imagine, right? And he can do anything he wants to do, but he wants us to be a part of that. Sometimes we had to take a step of faith initially, right, before that even. We just yeah. said, okay, Lord, we're going to do it. If we have to do it ourselves, we'll do it. But he just provided we did more, a devotional a couple months ago, and it talked in that devotional devotional about making sure that you don't have a passive faith, right? Like God calls us to walk, and he directs our steps, but that implies that we're walking and not passively sitting there waiting for him to do something. So we took that leap of faith, and we were like, yep, let's go. We'll figure out the finances later, and then God figured it. He already had it figured out. He so did. And one quick thing left. Uh, I just wanted to say, too, that, you know, we all contribute, and sometimes maybe physically or just jobs and schedules and things won't allow us to go, but we're all a part of that, right? You know, some people go, some people share, like that buddy at work of mine, he opened his wallet and was like, I got 50 bucks, and I want to give it to you. So we all, we all, we're all a part of this mission, right? And we all have a mission field here, but sometimes we contribute in other ways, but God is good. All right, Hallelujah. So uh, as tradition here, we want to pray for our missionary group that's going down to Mexico or any place else that they go. And so what we also do is encourage you to pray for them all throughout this week when they're gone, as well as beyond. So pray for them as a group, pray for them individually, pray for everything that the Lord has called for them to meet and accomplish and go and serve and do down there. Uh, they really do provide a, an incredible ministry to the orphanage and to the workers who uh, need tremendous amount of care when we get down there. So uh, pray for this group and, and join me now in praying as they get ready to travel. So, Heavenly Father, we just want to lift up every detail of their journey down to Mexico, Lord God. We pray for flights. We pray for border crossings, Lord God. We pray for uh, mechanical success with all the vehicles and the trailer and everything else that's going down there, Lord God. And we pray that you'll give them effective hands and feet to do the work of the ministry that you've called them to do, Lord. Pray that they would each get good sleep when they have an opportunity to sleep and that they would pour themselves into the work of the ministry that you've called them to, Lord God. 
I pray that the blessings that you have for each and every one of them individually and as a group, Lord God, would just flow in abundance to them, Lord God. Let them be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit, just like we heard from Josh and Emily earlier. And Lord, I pray that your effective calling would be part of their ministry in Mexico, Lord. Lord, let this, this ministry is so important to this church, and I just pray that you will use this occasion to bring about your glorious purposes through the faithful hands, feet, and obedient hearts of those who go and serve. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, thanks, everyone. All right, would you stand with us?
in, God, you break those chains for us. God, when we needed shelter, God, you were that shelter for us. God, we just thank you for what you provide. You are so good.
church, let's thank him this morning. You never run dry, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. God, we do thank you today that we can always depend on you. You are faithful. in just as that song we sang, God. God, you love us. And just as that sheep who wanders away, God, you come and find us. And we need some discipline. You love us and you discipline us. We need encouragement, God, because life has been hard. You are that encouragement to us comfort us and you love us. You give us grace. God, we thank you for that today. And so we turn that back into worship. Lord, we just give this to you.
Senhor. I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation, and I will put my trust in you alone. And I
us one more time, please. And Lord, we just want to raise our hands and proclaim you are holy. You are God. You are on the throne. You are our king. We worship you and only you. God, we follow the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You are supreme. There is no one like you. No, not one like you. We are all false gods. We cannot compare to you. And there is no human with any power, with any control that you cannot. God, you just would squish them like a bug because you are so big and you are so powerful. And we worship you. So together, church, can we do this? It might be a little uncomfortable for some, but just as a way to proclaim him in your life, that he is holy, that he is the only one, that he sits on the throne and that you worship him today. Would you do that with me? Let's sing it together with our hands held high. And I'm holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you, open up my eyes in a wonder and joy. Yes, Lord, that is our prayer. God, fill us. Fill us up. We do worship you today. God, we know you're moving. We sense your spirit today. You are here with your people. Lord, let our hearts be soft and sensitive to you today, that we can receive what you have for us because you are speaking, and you want to speak a word to us and to our hearts. So we open our minds, our hearts, our spirits, to receive from you today. And everybody said, Amen. 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 All right. Thank you, worship team. Good morning once again. Again, if you don't know me, I'm Pastor Scott. So glad you're here. And <clears throat> our uh, most recent study we've been going through now for about five weeks is a study through the book of First Thessalonians. Actually, we're going to look at both of them. There's two. There's First and Second Thessalonians. And so, just as a background, really quick, Paul wrote, uh, or Paul actually visited and established a church there in Thessalonica around 47 AD, and about uh, 17 or so years, roughly, after Christ went to the cross. And then he wrote this letter a couple, about four or five years after that, so maybe 50, 51, 52 AD. It's all a little bit speculative as far as those dates, but they feel pretty good about it. And... Paul is writing a letter here to a church that's new, it's been established by him, and he wants to make sure that all questions and concerns are addressed as they, yeah, thanks Vance, good to see Vance back. So Paul's writing to make sure that they are doctrinally sound, able to function as a church, and what we're going to see here is he's commending them it, through this little section that we're going to read through for being very, very good at following his instructions and being examples to those around them. So this is where we get started. So if you want to turn in your scriptures wherever you have them, in devices or in Bibles or online or looking on the screens here, Paul writes to the Thessalonians this, starting in verse 6 of chapter 1. And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit so that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia, sorry, I have to pronounce that the way my Greek Bible thing does, who believe. Okay? For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. For your faith toward God has gone out so that we do not need to say anything for they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living God 
and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Okay. Well, that's the section that we have time to deal with this morning. Let me give you a little bit of a geographical per perspective of what we're looking at here. Okay. This is the ancient world. Of course, Israel would be down a little bit further south than it's on the screen here. And you may not be able to see the names on the screen, but this is basically what we call Asia or Asia Minor in the biblical account of things. And then Paul had traveled from Asia Minor over in here to Philippi and then took that 100-mile journey over here to Thessalonica when he established the church there. And then he kept on going to Berea and Corinth down here in, in the area of what is called Ahai. Okay. And so Paul, when he mentions that their testimony, their faith, their understanding of God in this young, somewhat fledgling church at this point, just a few years old, their, their reputation as being Christ followers and Paul followers is spread up into the Macedonia in the north of where their city is located and all the way down south, hundreds and hundreds of miles away from where they were, people are talking about the faith and the testimony of the people in Thessalonica. And Paul here is commending them for being incredible examples. We'll get to that in a moment. But the first thing he wants to, uh, or the first thing he does talk to them about is he says he wants them to be imitators of him and Christ. And I'm going to say not just followers. Now, if you're reading along in the New King James like I gave you, it says Paul is praising them for being followers of him and of the Lord. But the word actually deals with something a little bit more familiar. We'll talk about that. So Paul is commending the believers in general here at Thessalonica because they first became followers of Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, the, the missionaries who came to establish the church there. Okay. But the word followers here, again in the New King James, is really the Greek word mimetes which is to be an imitator or where we really get the word to mimic. Okay? So they're mimicking Paul. They're imitating Paul and Silvanus and Timothy. Okay? So if Paul is living for the Lord, Paul is serving the Lord, if Paul is doing these things, then Paul is commending them. It's like I'm looking in the mirror. You're imitating me and I'm imitating the Lord and that's a good thing. So the command or the the instruction here is to continue on doing what they're doing. The commendation is that they are being good imitators. Imitators of Paul, who's a faithful servant of the Lord, and therefore imitators of God himself. Okay. So this is our charge, and I believe Paul is writing this. He knows it. We should know it, that this command, these instructions, are for all the church at all times. We're, all of us, 2,000 years later, are called to be very good imitators of Paul, who is a very good imitator of Christ. So this is for, for us, not just an ancient church a couple of thousand years ago in the city of Thessalonica. Okay. So here's a couple of points on that. Paul preached the pure truth of the gospel. Okay. If you read Galatians chapter 1, Paul is very, very protective of his preaching and teaching and the authority that comes of the gospel of Christ. So in Galatians, Paul is commending, well, Paul is actually chastising the Galatians because they've abandoned the pure truth of the gospel, okay, all too quickly. But to the church at Thessalonica, he's saying, look, I preach the gospel in truth, and I hear through all the reports that come back to me, you are doing the same thing. You are holding truth to the same doctrine that Paul taught. We don't need any deviation. We don't need any wandering astray in the text. If Paul taught it, you know it's true. If Paul didn't teach it, you need to see if it's taught somewhere else in Scripture. And if it's not, you better stop teaching it. Okay? Because the truth and the authority comes from God, comes from the Holy Spirit, comes from his authorship of this word. It doesn't come from the minds of men. And it's, we certainly need to protect it from the schemes of the devil who tries to completely change and, and uh, avert all of our attention from what the truth of Scripture actually is. Okay. So, look at this church. Young. They came, and he tells us at the end there in chapter, or verse 9, that these were idol-worshiping pagans. And in just a couple of years, they completely abandoned all of their hold on the world and everything the world was drawing them to worship pagan idols, and they are continually, regularly, reportedly, 
holding firm to the truth of Scripture. The truth was not even Scripture at the time, as far as what Paul had taught them, because this is one of the first things that ever got written. Okay, so what they're holding to is Paul's words, not actual letters like you and I have the blessings of having. We get the whole thing encapsulated in a leather-bound Bible. They only had Paul's words, and years later, they're still speaking the same truth that Paul spoke to them. Okay. So then he writes the letter, and we start to see God forming the canon of Scripture that we can there carry under our arms wherever we go. Right? So point number two, Paul engaged in fearless evangelism, even risking his own life and safety. A few weeks ago, we talked about it. Paul preached for a number of weeks in the city of Thessalonica, first in the synagogues, and then he started to be a, uh, a member of Jason's house. But then there was an uproar in the city, and they, Paul escapes barely with his life. Sometimes it seems he doesn't actually escape with his life. He actually, at one point, seems to be raised from the dead. But Paul constantly is speaking the truth regardless of the consequences to himself in his flesh and his health personally. And he's commending the Thessalonian church that they're willing to do the very same thing. This church is under persecution by their neighbors, by their friends, by people that do not want to hear the truth of the, of the scriptures, do not want to hear the truth of who Christ is. I mentioned that last week, that you could, you could mention any other deity in the 30,000 some odd deities in, in the Roman Empire, and you'd be fine as long as that name wasn't Jesus Christ. But these people in Thessalonica are preaching Jesus Christ, and it's costing them everything. Persecution, trial, tribulation, all of those negative things. So Paul goes from city to city to city to city, often stoned, often shipwrecked, often beaten with rods. He is constantly embattled, and his flesh is constantly under attack. And yet he never stops, because the Lord, his Savior, didn't tell him to stop. He told him to keep going, keep enduring, keep suffering. And the people of Thessalonica are being good imitators. They're doing the same thing that Paul was doing, so much so that hundreds of miles away from where they live and go to church, their reputation is strong everywhere in Macedonia and Achaia. Okay. Paul lived a life in complete submission and honor to the Lord. This is what drove Paul in every task, everything that he did, whether it was his being a tent maker, trying to fund his own way through all those missionary travels, or whether it was standing up in a synagogue and knowing that the Jews would cast him out or stone him because of his words. Paul was always faithful, and he lived a life that was completely surrendered to the Lord. If, the, if Paul wanted to go through this door and the Lord said, no, I closed that door, but this door is open for you, Paul went through the open door. He didn't try to go through the door he wanted to go through. He always submitted and surrendered to the will of the Lord. And this is the same kind of action we see here in Thessalonica. They are being humble and submitted to the will of the Lord in their lives. Paul's life, we know from, like, say, let's say, Hebrews in chapter 13, Paul's life was above reproach. He had a clean conscience before everyone, no matter where he went, no matter what he did. Yeah, Paul had a lot of skeletons in his closet from his life as a Pharisee in persecuting the church. But when he got that Damascus Road conversion, when he fully understood the nature and the person of Jesus Christ and became a follower of his, he can, he can honestly say, you can look at every category of my life you can look at everything in my life, and I have a clean conscience before the Lord. So I believe Paul wrote Hebrews, as I've always say. So here's what he writes in chapter 13, verse 18 of Hebrews. Paul says, pray for us, for we are confident that we have a good conscience in all things desiring to live honorably. So those who imitate Paul, as he instructs us to do here, Shouldn't we also have a clean conscience in all things, desiring to live honorably, not just before men or human beings, but before the Lord himself? Now, all of us are imperfect. I'm certain that Paul had sin in his life till the day he died. In fact, he confesses that, doesn't he? As he gets closer and closer to the end of his life, he says, I am the chief of sinners. So he knows that he has sin. And yet, he can make a statement that says, 
I am confident that in all things I desire to live honorably. Because what does Paul say in Romans chapter 8? The things which I desire to do, I don't find myself doing. And the very things I don't want to do, that's the things that I'm doing. Oh, wretched man that I am. Right? We recognize we all have sin. But we can all have that first, that heart desire to live honorably before the Lord. A clean, pure conscience before him. When we fall, he picks us up. When we stumble, we apologize to the Lord on our knees for our sins, and we let him do the restoration process in our lives. But our heart's desire, if we want to be good imitators of Paul, is to be a person who lives honorably before man and God with a clean conscience. Another point here. Being imitators of Paul, the believers were also imitators of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's multiple places, I didn't quote it here for you, multiple places where Paul says, like I think it's 2 Corinthians 5, where Paul says, be imitators of me as I also imitate Christ. Follow me as I also follow Christ. These are multiple places in Scripture where Paul says, I'm following Christ. The best thing that anyone else can do in their life is to follow me. Now that not, that's not a prideful statement of Paul. He's not being prideful and saying, just follow me and you'll do, your life will be fine. He's saying, I follow Christ. You follow me because you'll see Christ as I follow him. It's like that kind of that sense of, you know, if you're, you're walking through a minefield and there's a bunch of mines in the field and you know the guy, one guy knows how to navigate the minefield. So he says, every place I put my foot, you put your foot. If you step outside of my footprints, you may step on a landmine. And Paul is saying, you follow so precisely, so closely my footprints, because I put my footprints where Christ has told me to put them. I'm following him, you follow me, we'll all be safe, we'll all have a clean conscience before the Lord. So believers, all of us, let us have this sense of imitating Paul. That kind of means we need to look at what Paul's life is like. Again, we've said Paul is willing to suffer physical harm for his faith. Paul is willing to boldly proclaim the truth of the gospel. Paul is willing to surrender all of his own desires and passions and submit them fully to the Lord. Paul will never, ever, ever compromise on the truth of the authority of God's word. Stand against even the other apostles when they're wrong. Right? So Paul is unwavering in his obedience and imitation of Christ, which also, I think, includes love and, and concern and compassion and prayer. We looked at that in the first verse or the second verse. Paul regularly, constantly, continually prayed for the church. So it's not like Paul's this harsh guy who's like, well, I'll just suffer for the kingdom of God and you people just get in line. Right? He's constantly praying for the believers in the kingdom of God, constantly desiring their best, constantly checking up on them, wanting to know how they're doing. He's a man of compassion and concern with unwavering commitment to his duty to God first, foremost, and always. That's who we're supposed to imitate. It's both hard and yet it's somewhat simplistic, isn't it? If we can just strive to live a life like someone like the Apostle Paul, how much more could the Lord use us to further his kingdom, just like he was doing here to the Thessalonican church? Paul's admonition is to all believers for all times. That's for all of us. So I've said that. We're all called to be imitators of Christ. Paul helps us to understand even more clearly how to imitate Christ. And so we are called in our own lives regardless of who we are, regardless of what we're doing or what we are called to in any form of ministry, we are called to imitate Christ. That should be a top primary objective in our daily life. So how can we do that? A couple of points. We can mimic godly leaders in faith and practice. So I don't want you to follow me because I'm a leader. I don't want you to follow anybody because they're a Christian leader somewhere. What we need to do is follow them when they are leaders who are demonstrating faith and practice that is consistent with the truth and authority of God's word. Right? 
So we don't follow men, we don't follow people, we follow imitators of Christ. So when you see, but it, it, well, here we are 2,000 years later, we don't, we don't have a Paul anymore, we don't have a Peter anymore, we don't have a John anymore in the apostle who followed Christ. So now we expect and demand that people in leadership in the church are following in that same tradition of following Christ and doing our best to hold firm to the truth and authority of God's word and trying to live a life with a clean conscience in full surrender and submission to God. If you see that in a leader and you see that leader unwilling to compromise in the truth of scripture, you are well advised to begin mimicking them, imitating them. Well, they spend time in the scripture. I want to spend time in the scripture. They spend time in prayer. I want to spend time in prayer. They say no to secular things that will bring them into a life of, of surrender to the world rather than surrender to Christ. I want to live the same kind of life where I won't compromise. I'll not go to that movie. I'll not read that book. I'll not go to that website because that would not be having a clean conscience before the Lord. And so if you have leaders who are willing to do that, then we can follow them. That's why God put them in our pathway. Okay? And we can also then, as we see any leader, this please make sure this is true for you versus me, but every leader you see, we've got plenty of influence out there in the social media world. Okay? Be good Bereans. If you don't know what that means, we'll see what Paul says about that in Acts 1711 here in just a second. Be good Bereans. Don't trust the words that come out of a person's mouth just because they're in a position of leadership. Don't trust a person just because they have some sense of authority. Don't, be, don't trust a person just because they speak boldly and confidently. Trust what they say because it conforms completely, unwaveringly to the truth of God's word without compromise. Acts 17.11, Paul writes, or Paul speaks, these were more, more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica. We're talking about Thessalonica, but he's even praising the Bereans with a higher level of praise in this matter. Okay? Speaking of the Bereans, in that they received the word with all readiness. They heard a preaching. They heard a teaching. They went to YouTube. They went here and there and everywhere, and they listened with readiness to receive truth. Okay? And then what did they do? They searched the scriptures daily to find out whether or not what was spoken to them was true. So we need to put, not put up blockades and say, oh, well, I can't, can't receive truth from this source or that source or that source. We can say, if they're a person who has demonstrated that they're in a leadership position, that they preach and teach the word of God, generally speaking, we can go, I'll receive that word with all readiness. But I will not accept it as truth until I confirm it with my, for myself in the scriptures. That's what a good Berean does. That's what Paul is admonishing each of us to do. Imagine how much more pure and sound of doctrine the church could be if these wolves in sheep's clothing were actually checked against the truth of Scripture. We got mega churches with tens of thousands of people who attend every single day, and they get lied to by a very charismatic, dynamic presenter, and they never go home and search the scripture. It's sad. But I think the, the Thessalonians, the, the church at Thessalonica, were absolutely commended in the same way because they refused to do anything but be imitators of Paul, who imitated God and held to the truth and authority of scripture. We can also, I, we're, I believe we are called, I know we're called from Scripture, we are called to submit to godly leaders. Notice the point is godly leaders. Okay? Not just leaders, but godly leaders. Okay? And then to hold up their hands, because godly leadership is very, very tiring. It really is. To constantly be under threat, under attack, wondering what this person says and does and thinks and all that, it's incredibly challenging to be a leader. And so we need people to come alongside us like Moses had against the Amalekites and have people lift up the hands. But we can only do that when we know that they're first a godly leader. 
So I'll bring you back to Hebrews 13 again. Paul writes this about speaking about those who rule over us, our leaders. In verse 7 of chapter 13, Hebrews, Paul writes, Remember those who rule over you. How do you know that they're the right rulers? Because they have spoken the word of God to you. Then you follow their faith, whose faith followed, because they spoke the word of God in truth to us. And then it says, considering the outcome of their conduct. If their conduct doesn't match the words that they're speaking, then they're not a godly leader. But if we remember those who've spoken the word of God to us, we follow their faith, we consider the outcome of their conduct, we have an example of a godly leader if we evaluate them properly. Ten verses later, he says this, Obey those who rule over you and be submissive. So it's called the church to obey godly leaders. Obey those who rule over you and submit to them. Be submissive. We love that word in our culture, but be submissive. For they watch out for your souls. What is a godly leader in the church really doing? Watching out for our souls. We may not care about the color of the carpet or the color of the lights or the color of this or the color of that. We care about the souls, right? Somebody else can worry about that. We care about the souls of those that we are entrusted to lead by God. Because why? Because a godly leader must give account. I wonder who he's speaking of that we must give account to. James, in James 3.1, says, not, let not many of you desire to be teachers, because teachers are held to a higher standard. They will be judged more strictly. Right? We watch out for souls. If we're appointed in a church leadership function, we are watching out for souls. Watching out for souls and have to give account to God for who and how we have led souls to him under his authority. He says, let, so the instruction here is, let them do that. Let them lead. Let them care for your soul. And don't, let, don't be grievous to them. Actually, be, let it be joyful that we're leading. Because you're continually looking at the call and the prize of Christ in eternity. Because it would be unprofitable, Paul says, to you not to follow a godly leader. I promise you. It will be unprofitable, unprofitable, oh, I can't say it, unprofitable for any of us if we follow an ungodly leader. It's guaranteed to bring destruction on our relationship with Christ if we're following an ungodly leader. So we need to follow godly leaders. We need to support them. We need to help not make it something that's grievous to lead, but joyful. And when we do, it's good for us. It'll be profitable for our relationship. And I know many of you know it, but let's read just a few verses here out of Exodus 17. This is that story of Moses and Joshua and Aaron and Hur in the battle against the Amalekites. Starting in verse 8. Now Amalek came and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said to Joshua, Choose us, some men, and go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And so it was when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands became heavy. So they took a stone and put it under him, to, and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and one on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. So Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Godly leaders need someone to help hold up their hands. Isn't it great that God appointed people? In the church, we all serve a role and a function and a capacity. I talked about that last week. There is this sense that God has appointed us to works and to service and to be a part of the kingdom and the community of God. And there might be still some form of a hierarchy in the church. There needs to be. You can't have plurality of leadership when it comes to ultimate decision making. But 
We do need to be surrounded by leaders. So here's Moses. Joshua is his number two. He sends Joshua to go do battle. And here he also is supported by Aaron and her. And when Moses becomes fatigued, they come alongside and help him to endure the battles that he's facing. That is not just a story. That's just not just a specific event that took place. You see, that's a model, don't you? That God used that model of Moses needing Aaron and her to come alongside him to help lead. So godly leaders need other godly leaders to help support all the work that we're doing. This is how, all of this is under the, the instruction or the, the sermon title of building and equipping a church. This is relevant for us. We need to have hearts and minds and attitudes to support godly leaders, follow godly leaders, imitate godly leaders, and do what God has called us to be, to build the church, not our church, God's church, the kingdom of God. Okay. So, instructions to all of us. Be ready and willing to accept a leadership call from God whenever it comes. I genuinely believe that the scripture teaches every single person will be called to some form of activity, service, ministry within the body of Christ. We all have a part, a part to play in serving God's kingdom. So the question is, are we ready to serve when the call comes? Because God will call. Did Paul answer the call when Christ called him? Right? Imitate me, Paul says. Be imitators of me, follow me, be mimic of me, and then we do. And so Paul answered the call, we should do the same when the call comes. So be diligent to present ourselves as approved by God. Paul writes that to Timothy. I'll just let you look at that verse if you're on your own. But Timothy was diligent to accept the call. Paul knew that, Paul, that Timothy had a calling on his life, and he accepted that. And secondarily, do not refuse God when he calls. Okay? Do not refuse God when he calls. So first, you know, be diligent to answer the call. Don't refuse God. Remember, here's what, again, Hebrews 12 this time. Hebrews 12, see that you do not refuse him who speaks. I realize it's slightly out of context, but shouldn't that apply to all of us at all times? Do not refuse the Lord when he speaks to us. Do not refuse the Lord when he speaks. So I'll let you put the rest of that in context later. But Matthew records Jesus calling his disciples to himself. Just one place in the Gospels. But this is, in, this is instructive for us. So in Matthew 4, verse 18, And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon and Peter, or Simon called Peter, and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea. For they were fishermen. I imagine they thought they'd be fishermen for the rest of their lives. In, in, in the in lake, you know, fish kind of fishermen, not fish, fishers of men as Jesus would make them. Okay? Then he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And they immediately left their nets and followed him. Do you get a sense of what that calling looks like? Don't refuse him who speaks. Respond immediately when he calls us into service. And going from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in a boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. And immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. It's pretty clear what obedience looks like. It's immediate. I hear the call, I respond. I hear the call, I go and do. I don't count the consequences. Well, Lord, if I follow you, I'm going to have to, mm, I'm gonna, well, then I'm going to have to, well, it's going to, uh, no. They immediately left their boats, left their nets, and they followed Jesus. We should be just as good imitators of someone like Peter, James, John, and Andrew. So that led to this Thessalonian church being good examples in all aspects of their life. I mentioned at the top of this that their message of being faithful witnesses of Christ radiated out into all of Macedonia and down into Ahia. They were being known as 
people who were proclaiming the gospel of truth everywhere they went. Okay. And the truth of the gospel came to the Thessalonians with much affliction and, and or persecution. It's really, it should be relatively easy to evangelize, meaning to spread the news of the good news of Christ when your life looks pretty good. Hey, I've got a lot of money in the bank. I don't have any health problems. You know, I've got a good relationship with my wife and my kids and this and that and the other thing. You know, wow, your life looks awesome. I'd like to have that. Can you imagine going out and being a faithful witness when you're, you're trying to witness to people and there's a guy with a club right behind him trying to beat you up for speaking the message of the gospel? Hey, join me and that guy will want to beat you up too. And yet that's what they were doing. They were persecuted, persecuted, persecuted all day long and telling people, you want to join me in my persecution. And they were effective. People were abandoning lives of luxury and contentment and joining in the persecuted church because they believed that it was true. They believed that following the truth was better than following a lie. The lie brought all kinds of rewards. The truth brought promised rewards in heaven and suffering persecution right here on the earth. And yet, look at what Paul is saying here. He's like, I don't even have to go out to those regions anymore. Your guys' witness, because you're following me, you're imitating me, is so good, I don't have to worry about evangelizing those regions of Macedonia. They've been... They're listening and following you. So we have a different world. We can, most of us can, you know, get here to church without somebody trying to beat us up or steal our employment or our bank accounts or anything else. We can get here to church and we can go tell people about the good news of Christ. These people had it far worse and were far more effective than the average American is in sharing the truth of the gospel. And that includes me. I'm not casting aspersions. Okay. Despite the persecutions, these believers accepted and suffered the truth. Right. So afflictions did not hinder their faith. In fact, it says they found joy in following the leading of the Holy Spirit through all of their afflictions. They're being afflicted. They're being persecuted. They're suffering. And yet they said, that gives me just all the greater opportunity to press into the Holy Spirit because I need his comfort. I need his peace. I need his encouragement, and I need the truth that he speaks to my heart. Even while suffering hardship and persecution, the believers in Thessalonica shared faith, as I said. So then the Thessalonians were not quiet. They were active. They were vocal about their faith everywhere they went. Their message of the gospel, the word there, as he talked about, it sounded out, it was reverberating. We know what re reverberation is, right? It just keeps going over and over and over and over again, this reverberation. The message of the gospel from this persecuted church was reverberating as far and as wide as Paul could see their influence in hundreds of miles north and south around where this church was located. Does our witness for Christ reverberate through our, the communities that we serve? Our, our, our places of employment, our places of where we go to social contact, the, you know, uh, our family members who don't know Christ. Is our message of the truth and the hope that we have in the gospel of Christ reverberating out into the world? If it's not, then we're not quite where the Thessalonians were. But maybe we can imitate them. Their godly conduct and proclamation of the gospel was so effective, as I said, that Paul no longer needed to visit those locations. Talk about effective mimicry. There's only one Paul. He can only go so many places, and he went to a lot of places. Three-plus missionary journeys, and he's sharing the gospel, and he's building churches, and he's telling the truth of the kingdom. But there's only one Paul. But look at these mimicry. Look at these Thessalonians going out there and doing the work that Paul would do if Paul had the time to do it. That's how you build an effective church. And Paul was, had done it, and the Thessalonians were mimicking Paul and doing the same. All right, so last major point here. From idolatry to serving the living God. Look how far they came and how effective 
following a godly leader let them be effective in the kingdom of God. They were worshiping and serving idols. Okay? They're pagans. They're worshiping false gods. They have no relationship, most of them, some of them were Jews, but most of them were Gentiles. No relationship to Yahweh, no relationship to the God of the Old Testament, no relationship to anything that would resemble the truth of Scripture. They got converted under Paul's preaching, and they immediately begin to lay aside everything that was false and only accept that which is true and live it not and adapt it not only into their own lives, but to share it in the world that they lived in. So Paul's preaching converted them into these faithful servants, and, we, and, our, and they were supposed to be imitators, so their preaching should have been and was doing the same thing. So building the church should not be limited, right? We should not limit building the church. There's no reason to think that, well, if Paul doesn't do it, the church can't be built. If Scott doesn't do it, if Dennis doesn't do it, if Chase doesn't do it, if, some, if one of our elders doesn't do the work of the ministry, well, it's just not going to get done. There's no reason to think that the church can't be built through every participant, every converted follower of Christ, because we're all imitators of Paul. We're all imitators of Christ. We're all imitators of godly leaders who are showing us how to live a life that's well-pleasing to God. So even the most, here's what we need to look at. Even the most hardened hater of God may turn to faith when Christ's true gospel is preached. Do you have that hard nut to crack in your life? Somebody that you've been trying to witness to for a really long time, and they are antagonistic, they bring hatred to the truth of the gospel, they are far, you think they're far, far, far away. Well, the Thessalonians were idol-worshiping pagans. They didn't think they needed a Jesus Christ in their life. And Paul preached, they accepted the truth, the Holy Spirit convicted them, and brought them to faith. Don't give up on a hard case. Keep praying, keep witnessing, keep sharing the truth, keep being an imitator of Paul, even if they bring out the club and the bat and they try to bring harm, we keep sharing the truth of the gospel because it's that important. We, leaders, it says, cares about the souls. Don't we all care about the soul? Don't we all care about where someone is going in, in to spend their life with God or in eternity or someplace else where it's pain and misery all of the existence? Jesus Christ is central to sound doctrine and to serving the living God. We've got to follow sound doctrine. It means we have put Jesus Christ at the center of everything in the scriptures. He's got to be the center of our thinking. He's got to be the center of our heart and how our heart responds to the world. He's got to be the center of how we process and evaluate everything in the world that we see. If he's not the center, something else will take the place and Christ will get pushed out further and further with every new nuance that happens in our life. Okay. So, he, let's look at his life, okay, in the sound doctrine. Here's what we should be remembering as we close out here. He was crucified as a substitute for our sins. That's the message of the gospel. I'm a sinner. He went to the cross for me. Technologically, or technologically, at least theologically, in circles, it's called the penal substitutionary atonement, PSA. You can take it or leave it if you like. But penal, like penalty, he took the penalty, but as a substitute for the one who should have been penalized. And his, his, his taking the substitutionary penalty provided atonement for me so that I can be in right relationship with God. And he did it for everybody. So it's a penal substitutionary atonement. It's biblical, and it's what Christ performed for us on the cross. Share that message with everybody. You don't need to use the term penal substitutionary atonement, but we can say Christ died for your sins in your place to provide a right, connected relationship with the Father in heaven for eternity. There's ways you can say it even clearer than that. So he was raised from the dead. Jesus Christ. Who is Jesus Christ? He was raised from the dead in victory over, over sin, over death, over hell, over the grave. It no longer has a hold on us. It no longer has victory over us. Jesus Christ conquered all of these things. He is the victor. 
Don't we want to get people out of the hell, out of the grave, out of the sins that we're living in, and into his glorious kingdom? It only happens if we preach the truth of Scripture. He will come again from heaven and deliver believers from the coming wrath of God against all unrighteousness and sin. There is a day coming. There is a day of judgment for every person who's ever breathed a breath of life on this earth. There's a day of judgment coming. And Jesus Christ is the answer to having the right response. It's not, well, Lord, my good work sort of outweighed my bad things. Not going to work. The only thing is, I plead the blood of Jesus Christ over all of my sins. And we will be granted eternal life. Through him, in him, and because of him. So if we understand these truths, uh, and the truths that these provide a rational basis for believers to endure all afflictions, if we really believe these things are true, we will never compromise all of the kinds of afflictions the Thessalonians face, or that we, right here, face in the 21st century. We will never compromise these truths. Too many people do. All right. So I want to close out with these, this reminder of these things. If we're facing any kind of affliction for sharing the faith or living a life of godliness without compromise, the way Christ would have us to live it, the way Paul would have us to live it, and if I can put myself in there the way I think I need to live it, and I hope that you also would like to live it. If God is for us, who can be against us? We want to be on God's side, not against God. Paul says that in Romans 8. What shall we say then to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Of course, it's a rhetorical question. Nobody can be against us if God is for us. Right? Nobody. Not not the way of victory that comes from God. Enduring afflictions, right? So God will never leave us or forsake us. Man can do nothing to us. Oh, I mean, we think they can, but God will never leave us or forsake us. So if if something is happening and we're a servant, sold out person for God, whatever's happening is also in God's God's will to allow to happen because he will never leave us. He'll never forsake us. So if Paul is getting shipwrecked and beaten and stoned and flogged and all these things that he went through, God allowed it. And it didn't change his love for the Lord or his willingness to surrender to the Lord, even for a second, it seems. We should be the same. And then it's far better to suffer beyond measure in this life than to experience experience even a moment of God's eternal wrath. It is so much better to suffer beyond measure here in this body, in this existence, than to suffer even a fraction of a second of God's wrath. But unfortunately, he doesn't offer unbelievers who haven't been covered in the blood of Christ a fraction of a second of his wrath. He offers them an eternal destiny of wrath upon wrath upon wrath upon wrath upon wrath that never, ever, ever, ever ends. And so we need to be right with him, living in obedience to him, mimicking Christ in all of the days of our life, and radiating, reverberating those truths out into our environment, wherever we go, wherever God calls us to share, and to be bold and obedient in serving him, regardless of earthly consequences. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the insight that you've given us in this church at Thessalonica through Paul. Lord, he gave them strong commendation for a life well lived, for a testimony that reverberated throughout all of their communities and resources where they went, Lord God. We thank you that they were imitators of Paul. We thank you that Paul was an imitator of Christ, Lord. I pray that we would learn how to apply that in our own hearts and minds, that we would follow you, follow the godly leaders that you have appointed for us to evaluate their conduct And follow them the way you've called us to, Lord. Lord, I just pray that our hearts and minds would be open to every leading of the Holy Spirit. In everything that we do, let us be imitators. Those who mimic our Lord and Savior until we meet you face to face in eternity. 
And that can only happen because we are covered and washed clean of all of our sins by the blood of Jesus Christ. So we, we pray that that would, in fact, be our heart's testimony today, that we are clean and cleansed and purified by your blood, and we are ready to stand before you whenever you call us home. But between now and then, let us be effective ministers of the gospel and being readily obedient to the things you call us to. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we have prayer teams up front, so please avail yourself of any prayer needs you have. Don't leave this place without uh, you know, making sure that people know you are a believer in Christ. We'll see you soon.